Hey there, this is Raimu, and this is part 13 of my introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. Today we're going to be talking about reference counting and interior mutability. So I'm going to start today with the example I had from the last video, which covered a binary tree. But instead of a binary tree, this time we're going to be handling a different kind of data structure called the directed acyclic graph. And this is in order to introduce a reference counted pointer and how that might be useful. So if we were to try to code the data structure for this, it looks kind of similar to the binary tree, where we have nodes and then we have indirect pointers from one to another. So let's start with my binary tree example and turn it into one that works with one of these direct acyclic graphs. So instead of a left and right, we're going to have multiple references to many different places. So we could represent this, I guess, as something like edges and a vector of nodes. So this data structure works because the vector could be empty, so it's not an infinite size structure. The problem we're going to run into down the line is in this case, this D node, to have it be indirectly referred to by both B and C, it can't be in two vectors at once without having some form of indirection. So if we naively approach this using the same sort of indirection we used last time, which was using box. We're going to run into another problem that, although we solved the problem of indirection, we have the problem that two boxes can't refer to the same object. So to solve this completely, we need to introduce a new type, which is the RC, or reference counted, pointer. In the last video, I talked about how box is essentially a smart pointer to an object that's on the heap. And I described box as the way you'd manage a value on the heap. And I wasn't completely telling the truth there because box isn't the only type. The RC type can also handle a pointer to an object on the heap. In addition to having that pointer, it also keeps track of a counter of how many references to that object exist. When we create the first reference, that counter is initialized to one. After that, every time we make a clone of that RC, we end up getting the same pointer, but have that counter incremented to two. Every clone of that RC is going to have the same reference counter. They're all shared amongst the whole group. So going back to this example, the B, C nodes are going to have a reference count of one, and the D and E nodes are going to have a reference count of three. So let's work on constructing that data structure. Um, in this case, if we wanted to replicate exactly what they had in Wikipedia, instead of using an integer, we'll use a string slice. And then this value here would be a, and then A is going to have B, C, D, and E nodes. Now we know B and C are referred only by A, so we can put them in place. We know that D and E are going to be needed when we create B and C though, so let's create them right off the bat. In fact, we need to create E first because D needs to refer to E. So let's make an E equal a node of value E. And E has no edges, so we can simply say vec new, or really you can just have an empty vector here. That lets us define D to be a node where its value is D, and its edges a vector of E. At that point we can have our A, and its edges we can construct in place. So we have B, which is going to be a node, where the value is B, its edges are just going to be a a D, then we have C, its edges are D and E. Then we have D, and finally E. Now let's update our display function. It's still going to be recursive, and it's going to illustrate how we can reach the same nodes multiple times. So it's still going to print its value. Instead of having this left and right though, we're just going to say for edge and edges, borrow edges, and simply say edge.display. We'll leave in the up there so that we know when we're going up from one node back to continue down a different path. Okay, I have some errors to fix, so I forgot to put the self there. RC is not imported directly into the namespace by Rust prefix, so we have to actually import it. It's from standard RC module. And because we're borrowing string slices here, I'm just gonna simply say that it's for the static lifetime since all of our strings are static. I also made the mistake of using single quotes, so let's change those to double quotes. And here's where we have to start creating those reference counts. So the way you do it is you take the object you create on the stack, 
And similar to how it works with box, you give it to the new function of RC. We have to do the same here where we create these nodes. So RC new here and here. I forgot to say that that's A, not root. We also need to make these reference counted. A doesn't actually need to be reference counted because there are no references to A. Now, when we start using these nodes that are referred to multiply, we're going to run into the problem of the fact that we used it in one place and we're not sharing them. So to fix this, what we do is instead of injecting D the first time, we're just going to clone it in place. And the same thing for E. And we used D twice, so we have to clone that one more time. And yeah, I used E twice also up here, so I need to clone it here. Every time we clone a reference counted object, we're not cloning the entire node. We're just cloning the pointer to the node and incrementing the reference counter. So when we run this, expand this up a little bit, we can see we're traversing this directed acyclic graph going to A and then B and then D and then E and then all the way back up. So we went A, B, D, E, all the way back up to A. And then went down the C, D, E path, C, D, E, and then down to D, E, and then back up. So we're basically traversing every possible path from A down to all the leaf nodes, which in this case, there's only one, which is E. Okay, so to illustrate a little bit more about how these various nodes are shared within the structure and the sharings to reference counts, and how that affects a lifetime, let's implement drop for node, just so that we can see when these nodes actually get destroyed. So as we learned in a previous video, when we implement drop, we can print something, and then that kind of tells us the point at which the value is going out of scope and is being cleaned up or destroyed. So in this case, right before it gets destroyed, we're gonna print the value, say something is destroyed. That'll be self.value. So now running our main program, we can see that at the very end, everything is destroyed. Now, what if we drop some things in the middle? So for example, let's say we constructed A and then we displayed it and then we just dropped A. And then after that, we printed something. So something like, that's the end. Just to illustrate that dropping A is gonna show us that A is being destroyed and B and C as well, but we shouldn't see D or E destroyed because we still have references in main to them. Now, sometimes Rust can drop something early, so to prevent this, let's have it display D before the end. And because we had moved D into A before, we're going to need to clone it here as well. So running that, we can see that when we get down to that's the end, we have only destroyed A, B, and C. D and E aren't destroyed until after. Now it's obvious that D isn't destroyed, but why isn't E? Because D had another reference count to E that it was holding. So hopefully that illustrates how RC keeps both a shared pointer to an object as well as a reference count so that you can share those objects. One thing to point out that's a limitation of RC is values held in, in RC are not mutable. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. If we were allowed to mutate a pointer through an RC and we made a copy of it elsewhere, it would allow us to have multiple mutable references or a mutable reference and an immutable reference at the same time, which is not allowed. Now, before I move on, let me talk about another little type that you'll see occasionally that's associated with a reference counted pointer or RC. It's called the weak pointer. Let's say, for example, that we didn't want to explicitly hold on to this D reference but we wanted to maybe get access to it later without holding on to a counter in the meantime. So for example, down here, we want to display it, but only if it still exists. So one way to do this is to transform our D in from a strong reference count to a weak one. So the way we would get a weak reference would be through RC downgrade and pass it that reference to D. Now to make sure that we're dropping the original D reference, we'll do it explicitly here. And let's say after dropping A, we'll see, can we still get to the original D by saying let D equal D weak dot upgrade. Now it returns us an option. So we would say if let some D equal upgrade, we can display it. Otherwise let's print something like D got dropped. So when I run this, we'll see that as soon as we displayed A and then dropped it, 
the entire graph got dropped, D got dropped, sorry, that's the end. Now, if we don't drop A until after, we should be able to get that D reference back. Let's have it print something here, recovered D, just to make it more clear when we run this program here. And we can see we're actually able to recover that reference. Now, we were only able to recover the reference because we didn't drop A, because A held D within its structure. So again, if we didn't use a weak pointer, and we hold, held on to the original D, we can still reference it even if we dropped A, like so. So the weak pointer comes in useful in other places, such as if you can imagine if we wanted in such a data structure as this to have pointers back up in the structure, if we used reference counts, we would have problems where we have circular references, which you want to avoid because having two objects reference each other, it's not only hard to construct, but if you were to manage to construct it, the reference counts could never get to zero because they refer to each other. Weak pointers are useful in breaking such reference cycles. Usually you have weak pointers point back to whatever is holding the strong pointer of itself. Another place where weak pointers are handy is when you want the lifetime of an object to be independent of some other task you have that wants to check to see if an object is still alive. It can hold a weak pointer. It doesn't extend the lifetime of the object, but from the weak pointer, you can attempt to upgrade it to see, does that object still exist? And if so, use it. And as you can tell from the names, downgrade and upgrade are how you convert between a strong and a weak reference. Downgrade goes from strong to weak. Upgrade goes from weak to strong. Okay, now that we've covered reference counted pointers, I also wanted to cover something that's somewhat related and comes up sometimes when you're using reference count, which is called the ref cell. The term associated with it a lot is interior mutability. So what is this thing? To explain that, let's drop down to another example, one similar to the one I had in the last video, where we have some trait animal, and we can ask an animal to speak, and we might have two structures, cat and dog, but just for simplicity, we'll just define cat today. And we're going to implement animal for cat, and to speak like we had before, we'll just have it print meow. And let's imagine that we have some function called work with animal that takes an animal. We can represent an animal through a trait object. So we can have a dine animal here, call it animal. And we can just say animal does speak. And in our main program, we can just make a cat. So let cat equal some cat and work with animal cat. Borrow that cat to work with them. Now running this, we get what we had in that last video where work with animal doesn't know about the type cat but can work with it through means of a trait. But let's say that we wanted the cat to remember the number of times that it was asked to speak. So we might have in, in our mind something like time spoken, which is some kind of counter. When we initialize cat, we'll need to set it to something. So we'll set it to zero to begin with. And then after we meow, let's try to increment that. And we run into our problem, oh no. We can't assign to it because we only have an immutable reference. Okay, so what if we try to get immutable reference? Uh-oh, we can't do that either because it's not compatible with the trait. We've fallen into a trap that happens sometimes where we've established an interface contract, so to speak, where we're told that we need to implement a function and we won't have mutable access to ourself when it's called. How are we going to accomplish this test? Now, in a more realistic example, you might have an interface that takes a certain object that's meant to be immutable, but you want to, let's say, decorate or mock that object to track something internally. Like maybe you want to have a counter for the number of times that that function was called, for example. So it's kind of similar to this where we're counting the number of times speak is called. So the trick here is to use this type called ref cell. What it is, is it allows you to put a value inside of something that's immutable, but it lets you at runtime kind of unlock it and get mutable access to it. So we would say ref cell use size. We have to import ref cell from standard cell module. And when we use it, we're going to need to borrow mutably in order to add one to it. And when we construct it, we're going to have to say ref cell new. And lo and behold, it's working. In fact, to make sure that this really is working, let's have work with animal call three times. And at the end, let's ask the cat to report and we'll have some implementation for cat or we have a function report that takes self 
and we'll just simply print the number of times that they spoke. I spoke blank times self dot times spoken. In this case, we don't need to borrow it mutably, so we'll just do borrow. All right, and running that, we can see that the cat remembers that it spoke three times. So how did this work? How was it that we were actually able to mutate the cat changing the number of times spoken inside a method that presumably we didn't have mutable access to. The way it works is RefCell internally uses some mechanics in Rust that allow you to kind of bend the rules a little bit as far as borrow checking goes. In a sense, you're delaying the borrow checking from compile time where it normally is to run time. In fact, we can see exactly where the borrow checking is done. It's done whenever we call borrow or borrow mute. Now, if we held on to the reference that we got back from borrow or borrow mute and then called it a second time, instead of getting a compile time error, we'll get a runtime error. So let's illustrate that. Let's hold on to the reference that we're borrowing to self time spoken and then try to get it again. We'll want to mark one of them as mutable. Now, we have no compile time error. It's going to warn me that I'm not using it, but that's fine. Problem is when we run this, we're going to get a runtime error. It's going to say that the thread main panicked, already borrowed, borrow mute error. So this is the runtime equivalent of a borrow checking error. As if we had borrowed twice and we wouldn't compile, it would tell us that we can't borrow it more than once. So one more thing to point out here is that you can see from the type inlay hints that it's not the type you might have expected. You might have expected to see something like let mute and and then mutable reference to u size for that, but instead we see this ref mute generic over u size. The reason we have that is because a reference by itself doesn't have any runtime support for remembering that the borrow was made and then issuing that runtime error if we accidentally get a second borrow. So this ref mute class is what does the borrow checking at runtime in a sense. So although it's a generic type, not an actual mutable reference, Mechanically, it works the same because it implements a deref trait, so it works as if it was a reference. Now, all this said about ref cell, you might think, wow, this is great. I can make functions that take immutable references and then sort of break the rules at runtime and mutate them. The guidance with Rust is to use this as a last resort because in doing so, delaying the borrow checking from compile time to runtime, you're not going to catch a lot of mistakes that you would otherwise make until your program actually runs. RefCell is designed sort of as an escape hatch or a tool of last resort for times when you know it should be safe to mutate something, even if at compile time you don't have a mutable reference. So today, in summary, we learned about reference counted pointers to heap objects and the magic type RefCell that allows you to delay borrow checking from compile time to runtime. In the next video, we're going to start to cover concurrency, which is a really exciting subject. It's probably going to take us multiple videos. We're going to start with basic threads. And right off the bat, we're going to see that there are multi-threaded versions of these types that we explored today. So instead of RC, we have ARC. And instead of RefCell, we have Mutex. So can't wait to go over that video. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.